First of all, Satya. Such a pleasure. Thank you for joining me. So we're on Microsoft campus right now. Can you tell me about this room we're in? Because this is a sort of an interesting space. Yeah, I mean, this is uh, a space where we think about uh, workspaces. Uh, okay. So we're not just talking about software, but even the physical space, and we get to play around and sort of imagine what the future could look like. Yeah, there's a lot of cool stuff in here. So you're the CEO of Microsoft. You have a big job. A lot of people, of course, know what Microsoft does, but I'm curious just what's your day-to-day -day like, especially this time of year, it's super busy. You've got these new products coming out. There's a lot happening. What do you feel like you're doing often right now as a CEO? You know, to me, it's such a privilege to be a part of Microsoft. I've sort of spent all my adult life here. And I think the thing that's unique about Microsoft is the opportunity I get and anyone of the 100,000 plus, plus people who get, work here get to yeah. really think about how are we empowering others through our technology, right? I mean, that's, we are, I always say we are a platform and a productivity company at the core. Uh, so whether it's a student in a, in a school or a small business or a large corporation, the question is not about the tech that we produce, but what are they doing creating with tech? And that's even today, you know, so when I look at the meetings I've already had this morning, yeah. and, you know, to be able to meet that cross section of the world that's being impacted by tech, that's just a privilege. And of course, being a CEO, you're not only in meetings, but you're sort of representing the company and its vision for the future. And I've heard you say that you have a clear vision for the future of Microsoft, and we'll get into that in a little bit. But I also wonder, so you've been the CEO for a couple of years, but you've been at Microsoft for much, much longer than that. So I'm curious if there are things that surprised you or that you found interesting that you learned once you got to this position as a leadership role. At Mir, yes, that's right. I've been close to 30 years now at Microsoft and you know, close to five and a half years as CEO, yeah. time flies. Um, there's a lot uh, that I learned. I mean, in particular, even though I grew up here, um, how multi-constituent um, the world is um, and what it means for a CEO to keep all of that in balance, uh, what it means for a company like us. It's of course about our customers, it's about our employees, it's about our partners, it's about our shareholders. Guess what? It's all about all of them all the time yeah. simultaneously. And to me, that's I think perhaps the realization. Uh, maybe I used to think about one constituent before at a time, right. and now it's a question of really thinking about all of it all the time. Gotcha. A lot of multifaceted pieces of focus. Did you get any advice from, so you followed up Steve Ballmer in that role, and I've also spoken to Bill Gates on this series. Do you, do you talk to them at all, or do you get advice from them about leading this company? Oh, absolutely. And, um, and in fact, the best advice I got was from Steve. Uh, in, in some sense, it was his parting advice to me. And I always remember that. He sort of said, be bold and be right. Uh, and it's sort of, if you're not bold, you don't do big things. Uh, but if you're not right, you're not going to be there for much longer. And so therefore, that ability to see the world as it is, and yet at the same time defy it, uh, is what our business is all about. For now, uh, Satya Nadella, my successor, is sort of taking things there to infinity and beyond, if you will. Okay, I have a quote from you to read Ooh. about Microsoft. You say, our business is to meet unmet and unarticulated needs of our customers. And I find that really interesting because that's a goal of a lot of businesses to be able to find out what cust potential customers are interested in and, and solve those things. How do you, and how does Microsoft figure out what people want before they know they want it? I mean, that, first let me say that's our aspiration. In fact, the reason why I got to that was I felt that what does it mean to codify design thinking in your culture, right? It's not about just go to the class called design thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's really about developing that deep sense of empathy for people you are trying to serve. Uh, and that means meeting unmet, unarticulated needs, getting behind even the words and actions you observe and hear. And uh, that's kind of where that comes from. One of the things that we are on a quest for at Microsoft is uh, what we call uh, growth mindset or confronting our fixed mindset. And okay. I think the real core of that is that empathy and that ability to continuously learn, push conventional wisdom. Um, and so I would say we'll, that's a journey that we'll never com complete. Right. Uh, but at least we can say today, are we learning? Are we today trying to be more empathetic towards that unmet, unarticulated need out there in the world? I also happen to be a big fan of Microsoft's 
design language right now. And we've, we've seen you know, this new hardware now with the Surface Pro 7 and these, these incredibly sleek, clean lines and everything. Everything is very well considered. So I'm a fan of that. Um, is this a part of Microsoft's vision for the future? Is sort of the way tech looks? No, it's, it, I would say we've become much more conscious of why it's important not just to think about the software experience, but to think about the software experience as it manifests in beautiful devices with great design and aesthetic, because ultimately people relate uh, to things as much as to software. Uh, and I would say that's kind of really uh, been what's the surf, if I say what's the biggest contribution of Surface, it's a, you know, a very sizable business for us. We're excited about the products it's creating and in fact, helping the entire PC industry. But the one thing that I'm most proud of of the Surface is it's created, I think, that design sensibility inside the company that's much more pervasive. And there's also, I mean, the products themselves are fantastic. They're obviously Microsoft's made Windows devices. How do you think about them being competitors to other Windows devices? So I, something I've, I've talked about all the time on this channel is Google makes Android devices and other companies make Android devices. So there's a potential advantage for that company to, to do whatever they want ahead of time. Um, Microsoft makes Windows. Microsoft makes Windows devices, and so do other companies. So how does this ecosystem, how do you think about that yeah, I mean, uh, relationship? No, it's a great, I mean, it's a very important question for us. Obviously, there is, you know, hundreds of millions of Windows uh, devices sold each year, and we make a small, very small percentage of them in Surface. So the goal here is to innovate on behalf of the entire ecosystem, create new categories, take the R&D risk, take the inventory risk, take the marketing risk, which sometimes is not possible for any one player in our ecosystem, and so therefore, that's sort of really what led to even the creation. If you think about Surface, nobody thought a two-in-one kit could create it, um, and uh, we created the category with Surface. It took us a couple of tries to get there, but that was all risk that we had to, as a company, take. And the other thing that you know, I, I'm you know, I love that Alan K code. If you're serious about your software, you will take your hardware seriously, and I think that makes sense. And uh, to us, really going that extra mile all the way to ensure ensuring from silicon to the cloud, things are coming together around the experience has been a very important thing for us. Do you think of them as leading the way for potential other companies to follow? So a lot of times you'll have design language cues or small things that you can match with the hardware. Do you feel like, you know, tying all that experience together is something for others to follow or is it just an, an option among the many options? No, it's for sure we expect uh, others to follow. Okay. Uh, but at the same time, what we're also trying to make sure is we're building devices ultimately. It's just not a hobby. Uh, it is a core part of Microsoft's business. But in doing a great job with it, I think we are inspiring others to do also uh, a great job and raise their game. If you look at the ecosystem today uh, and the quality of the PCs coming out, let's say this holiday, from everyone, and yeah. you compare it to sort of the pre-surface era, that's a marked difference. So I think raising standards across the board is a super important artifact and creation of new categories. All right, so part of this ongoing AI conversation, I think, is a lot of fun. Um, I've spoken to people who are very, very positive on AI and those who are you know, more weary about its potential negatives, but I've seen with Microsoft is doing great things with AI. For example, the neural chip on the Surface Pro X, taking a lot of those specific things with processing off of the main processor. How do you think about AI and, and its potential upside? How do you weigh it against its potential downside? I mean, I first start with a sense of possibility and optimism. Uh, in fact, one of the things that I care deeply about is um, how can AI bring more accessibility technology to people? So for example, what we've done with the eye gaze technology on Windows is yeah. fairly magical, right? I mean, the fact that you can type with your gaze uh, is now possible on any Windows machine, and that's something that's enabled by AI, or what we're doing uh, with just computer vision and seeing AI, or what we're doing with learning tools. The other thing, you inside of Edge or in any uh, Office document, you can now, if you have dyslexia, uh, have the ability to read uh, because of just the spacing that is just uh, being managed through AI. So these are all things, in fact, that are bringing more people into the mainstream of our workforce and our society, and that's fantastic to see. But at the same time, I'm clear-eyed about the unintended consequences. Uh, let's take bias, 
right? I mean, if you take a language model that has been trained and if it's sort of uh, got uh, bias embedded, you need to de-bias it. So that means we even have to raise the game in terms of the software engineering associated with the creation of AI so that we really don't have these unintended consequences. So that's what I would say is the balance that all of us as creators of AI have to strike. Absolutely. So if I have my, my final question to you is, there's a lot of exciting things happening in the world of tech. What's one super exciting thing to you in tech that Microsoft is not yet involved with? <laughs> Look, I mean, uh, we definitely are not going to Mars, um, yeah. you know, directly, but indirectly we would love. In fact, the one thing that I love about Microsoft being that technology uh, enabler is we don't need to be involved in all cool things in tech. Okay. Uh, we can empower all the people out there who are trying to do cool things around the world. Yeah. Love it. Be strong in the things that you're strong with and explore in other areas. Absolutely. And, and, and really help others. You know, the thing that I'm most excited about is whether it's somebody who's tried to cre create a solar grid in Kenya mm -hmm. uh, in the cloud or someone who's creating an autonomous vehicle. Uh, both of them can use computing tools, computing technology from us and really democratize the reach of digital technology. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you sitting down in this exciting time to talk tech for a little bit, and hopefully we get to do it again sometime. Absolutely. Thank appreciate you so it. much. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you.